Today is December 2nd, 2010. I am Karen Aronson. This interview is part of the MIT 150 Oral History Project. We are speaking this morning with Priscilla King Gray, a former First Lady of MIT and still a warm presence and leader in her own right at the Institute. Except for two years in the military, her husband, Paul Gray, who was MIT's 14th president from 1980 to 1990, has been at MIT since he enrolled as a freshman in 1950. Priscilla has been at his side for most of those years. She has helped guide and shape MIT's Public Service Center and the organization now known as the Women's League, taught cruel embroidery, raised four children, served as a hospital volunteer, and provided aid, comfort, food, and guidance not only to her husband, but to generations of students, faculty, staff, and others in the MIT community. She is an honorary member of the MIT Alumni Association and was awarded the Bronze Beaver, the association's highest honor. Priscilla, thank you for talking with us this morning. How did you and Paul meet? We were a blind date. Uh, let's see, October 27th of 1951. And uh, I, I was at Wheaton, I was a freshman at Wheaton. And the junior in my dormitory came to me and said, would you like to go to MIT Saturday? There's a field day and then there'll be uh, a dinner back at the fraternity. And that was it. Did you have a sixth sense that told you that you would spend the rest of your lives together after you met? What was that first day like? Well, he disappeared into a crowd <laughs> of, uh, he, he met me at the train station. And then he went and changed his clothes, came out in shorts, and he had two gloves. And he disappeared into a crowd of the freshman class and the sophomore class. And the idea was to see who could gather the most number of gloves. And so I thought I knew him when he went in, but when he came back really roughed up and dirty with all those gloves, uh, I wasn't sure it was the same person, but it was a fun day, and uh, it, it was the beginning of, I don't think we knew right off, but we certainly knew that winter. That, uh, so you were on the sidelines through the day as the freshman and sophomore class battled with each other, and that's he was a right. sophomore that yes, year. Yes, yes, and there was a, a rope. A tug, tug of war. Yes. And they did that. Over a mud pit, I think. Something like that. It was a messy day. The only thing that was nice was the weather. <laughs> <laughs> and then he cleaned up for dinner? Yes. He cleans up well. <laughs> did you even have a chance to talk before he dashed off into this melee? Not really. But I was so impressed because he walked on the outside on the edge of the uh, sidewalk. And in the high school where I went, we didn't have very many sidewalks, but certainly nobody had been taught to do that. And uh, I noticed that. Were you with other women from Wheaton? Were there classmates or the, friends? The, the woman junior? who asked me was, she was not with me, but she came up on the train and met her fiance. Who was in Paul's fraternity? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And so we saw them at dinner. Did you know her well or was she just looking for a likely fresh? You know, mentor? we were five weeks into the term. So I knew her as well as probably I, I knew anybody except my roommates and some friends in my own class. So a bit of chance there. That's right. What were you like when you first met him? 
I don't know. I of course I thought I I thought I was all grown up, but I look back and think I was very young, <laughs> very young. Um, and it, it it was a trip. I'd grown up in a small town. Wheaton was not a big college, and to come up here and see those two classes in that melee together, that was a lot of people. Did you wonder what you were getting into? <laughs> it's an interesting well, you know, introduction. It was, yes, it was, it was an introduction. And it was not at all my picture of MIT. It, it, uh, <laughs> what were your first impressions of him besides the fact that he knew manners. He, he walked on the outside on the sidewalk, and he met you at the train station. Um, I've been told that he was very bright. Um, and again, I was so green. I don't know what I thought very bright was going to mean, but he really seemed very normal and very nice. <laughs> What did you think of MIT or MIT men at that time? You were pretty new to the college, but did women at Wheaton have any notions that men from one college or another were better to date or to marry? Or I think Wheaton's link at that time was with Brown. It was so much closer, and there was a Pembroke then. Uh, and Pembroke and Wheaton were very alike in numbers and in the liberal arts. Uh, and so people often went to Brown to a mixer. But I had never done that, and I never did do that. <laughs> <laughs> did you have any sense of Paul's leadership qualities as you got to know him? Did he Certainly it? in the fraternity. Uh, it was clear that. He, uh, he held a, a place of affection, but great respect. And uh, it was interesting. When I met him, he had very good friends, older than he was, and younger. And it was interesting to see that interaction. And you started dating pretty regularly after that first uh, meeting? Yes. Yes. Has he changed much since you met him? I don't suppose so. I think probably I've just gotten to know him better. <laughs> <laughs> what else, what other impressions of MIT did you have beyond that first field day as you began dating? Well, I came up again uh, shortly after that. And we went sailing, and uh, that was lots of fun. And it turned out that I sailed for Wheaton, and so that was my first introduction to sailing on the child. And that was fun. And sailing was one of my passions, so it was nice to know that, that he enjoyed sailing. Had you sailed before you went to college, or was that the first time I'd you had ever been in a sail? I'd sailed since I was 12 years old, and so it was just it was just wonderful to be out on the water again and he was a sailor too he'd learned to sail his freshman year and loved it and uh, we sailed up and down and took a picnic and had a lovely time so that was one of the things you found you had in common pretty quickly that's right what other kinds of things do you we both enjoyed the MFA the museum of fine art yes and we we didn't have any money but we loved symphony and so we get in the line for the cheap tickets and sit way up we used to be able to go to amalfi for a, a one dollar pasta dinner and then we'd go on to symphony and uh, we could afford that <laughs> was he very engaged with mit when you met him other than with his classes and his fraternity his his fraternity uh, was just very important, Karen. He was an only child, uh, older parents, 
and those fraternity brothers were brothers in many respects. Right. Uh, very special friends. To this day, our special friends. And uh, as as we grow grew older, and I saw more of the fraternity, I understood how important they were. Uh, did you become close to those fraternity guys too? Oh yes, yes I did. Uh, they were very special. In our wedding, um, they've they've kept up with us. In fact, just this morning we were talking about one of them. Um, we invited a group of them that are, were around Boston after we got married, and uh, one of we had finished dinner and we I think I'd made a pie. Anyhow, we were having coffee, and one of his fraternity brothers got up, went out to the kitchen, and came back in holding his cup and said, your cream sour. Well, I didn't have any cream in the refrigerator. And I thought I knew what had happened, so I said, come on, Dick, let's fix this up. And we went out, and he showed me what he'd taken, and he'd put buttermilk in it. <laughs> and of course, it tasted awful, but it looked even worse. And uh, we were throwing out a buttermilk jar this morning and said, Remember that we, we, those things just pop in, but uh, we've just been blessed with those friendships. Did he go down to Wheaton much, or did you mostly come up to MIT? No, it was kind of even. I had an absolutely wonderful professor for American literature, and it met. We went to school on Saturday morning, and he would often. He got to MIT by hitchhiking, and um, he would come down for that class. He just loved that class. The professor had a terrible stutter, and so I got permission for Paul to sit in, and he fortunately gave that permission. And uh, he often, on Sundays, he came with a minister who had three or four churches and traveled one, one church to another. And he would go stand in Kenmore Square and the fellow would pick him up and take him to Wheaton on his way to, uh, church? to, uh, on his, way to his next church. Uh, he came with state troopers fairly often too. It's not a mode of transportation we wanted to see our kids use or our grand grandkids. But for him, it worked very well. It was a different era, too. Totally different. So Paul was engaged with his fraternity. He was active in this field day competition. Very was much into, his, into the activities of his department. His uh, work-study program was in the library. So he was well versed in library affairs. And then he stayed to do a master's because you were a year behind him and... You and he had a grant that right. he could not have carried over. And, uh, so and at least one professor wanted him then to stay on and do his PhD, but by yes. that time, after the master's, he wanted to leave the institute and complete his military service. And he said he wanted to become a captain of industry. Did you think you were marrying someone who would be the head of a company someday? I didn't really, but his father wanted him to be a captain of industry. I, di I didn't think that would come to pass. But uh, what did you think he would be when, when you were talking about getting would, married? You and know, when, when he finished his master's degree, he really had deferred the army service as long as he could. And he was ready for a break. He, he right. wanted out of here for a while. And I th guess I thought that someday he'd come back for a PhD. You did think that? Yes. Yeah. I always thought that. And so when he found out in the army that he actually liked teaching and wanted to return to MIT for more education, what was your reaction? 
fine. <laughs> you say, gee, I thought you might come to that. <laughs> we had, we, our first child was born at Fort Devens, uh, born at Groton, Mass, actually. And we had a fraternity brother who was in the service with us who had a child that was severely damaged should really have been, uh, should have died in those first two or three days. And they thought he would. And he lingered on. Um, they couldn't take care of him. His, his mind was that of a day old infant, but his body grew apace. And it was such a stunning blow. We all felt it because we were such a, a close group. And so Paul made no commitments. It, you know, the seed had been planted and we wanted to be sure that our baby was mm -hmm. all right and okay. Uh, so you had the first baby when he was in the military. That's those right. Those two years at four. And then another was on the way by the time he finished, I believe. Uh, yes, Amy when he came when he was part way done. And money was pretty tight, so he, he got done with the Army, and he had been teaching in the Army, mm -hmm. showing people how to use machines or keep them up. And, and I taught the first year, second grade, and then I substituted until Virginia came. Did you think you would keep teaching? Was that what you were interested in, or did you think it was a temporary thing? No, I, I really, I have always loved teaching, and I, I particularly loved the little ones. Uh, second grade was just perfect, um, and I thought maybe I'd get back to it. When he did return for his doctoral work, you already had the one daughter, another on the way, money was tight. Did you think about the standard of living you might be losing by his going back to school? Was that ever an issue? No, it wasn't. I think it was for his parents, but it wasn't for us. And we were lucky. My father uh, had inherited a dairy, which he ran. And he, in those days, coolers and, and things that kept things cold that needed to be cold were not what they are today. And he discovered that if he were wrapped the glass milk bottles in layers of newspaper that he could bring them. So they come for dinner that ostensibly I was putting on, but they would bring milk and buttermilk and eggs and all those things. And we got to be real pros at <laughs> vegetarian <laughs> things and dairy things, and and so we always we always had a good meal to put on the table. Why do you think Paul has been so attached to MIT? Um, what was the passion? In other words, even though he thought he wasn't going to come back when he left the first time, he did and then never left, really. No. He, well, he came back more of a grown-up. Uh, there was a lot of, I'm sure anybody from the outside watching him, watching me, would have said that that was a great growth period in our lives. Um, he loved being back. He loved being a graduate student. And he was a TA, so he had a right. chance to teach. But there was a fit between man and institution, it seems. There was. There was. Have you ever tried to analyze it or no, think it about just, what it, it is? It just was always there. I think he fell in love with this place, Karen, his freshman year. And as you say, the fit was there. And uh, everything about that first year of graduate school just reinforced the positive feelings he'd had in the four years before that. 
And you've had your own relationship with the Institute. Was there any particular point at which you recognized that it was your institute too, and that it represented more than just the place where your husband went to school and where he worked? Yes. Um, the answer may sound strange, but my peers in those days uh, were into um, social affairs that sponsored big occasions, fates, whatever, and uh, supported the one in Winchester, supported and paid for all the laundry that Winchester Hospital used for a whole year. A very nice thing, a very wonderful thing, but it wasn't my cup of tea. And so I did brownies and, and Cub Scouts with Andrew and um, more like second grade <laughs> kinds of activities. And uh, I think I think that it just happened. I just, Jean Brown, do you remember Jean Brown, Gordon Brown's wife? Jean Brown called me and said, how do we feed students and get faculty to ask students into their homes and make it possible for it not to be an expensive, high intensity work production. And um, I, I worked on a committee. We developed recipes. and I think we times were different than they are now. And there were many women at home who were quite willing to take this on. And it, it was a fun job. It was a fun assignment to stir up some interest and enthusiasm among the young faculty. And from there on, um, Jean just made sure that I was involved and, and uh, then I began to find things that I really wanted a part of. So I just, I, I did things that I enjoyed, but I came to MIT to do them rather than do them in Winchester. How would you describe the role you've played at MIT over the years? Well, I've teasingly said I was the den mother. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have an ax to grind. I'm tight with um, discussions that, that shouldn't go any further than, than me. And um, I love students. So I suspect that that wraps into some kind of a a ball that was helpful around here. In an interview not too long ago, Paul said that what surprised him most about the presidency was that it was hard to find people to talk to, that all of a sudden you really had no one else you could turn to. There were trustees for certain things or the chairman for certain things, but that there was a kind of loneliness that he hadn't anticipated, and that you were someone he could talk with about anything. Not only that, but he said that you provided him with another set of eyes and ears, and sometimes learned things that he wasn't aware of that were helpful. Were you conscious of those roles at that time, through the years, or of their importance? Yes. Well, I knew it was important for the two of us um, to talk about things. He just, there were things that he just needed to bounce around. And too often, uh, a president says something and it, then it's gospel. And that idea, he needs to try out, he needs to think about it. And you know, I could react and then he could gauge how the community or how whoever he was thinking about would react. And I think that was very helpful. Um, I think I think being 
eyes and ears um, fell into two categories. In the embroidery classes, there was great diversity and there was a wide range of people. And as people stitched, they talked about things. And I just had a, a, a feeling about the wellness of the Institute. Or if something was off, my rule was that if I heard about it three times, maybe I ought to say something. <laughs> but then there were other times when I think that I was used, information was, was placed to be transmitted to him that I thought was perhaps not useful, perhaps just stirring the pot. And so we kind of worked around those things. And if I said to him, I think this was said to stir the pot. He knew He knew that I was uncomfortable with it and that I thought that I was being a little bit used. And by having that kind of guideline to go by, then he could do with it what he wanted to do. Do you remember any issues in particular that you went that you brought to his attention or that you went to bat on? Um, there was a tenure position. And um, in fact, there were two. And one, I felt as if I was kind of being used. The second one um, had some really legitimate points. And I went to bat on those points. Other issues? I think you had a role in, in the student center renovation? I think probably that was, it, it, there's something at MIT called the client's team. And I was on the client team for the student center and for the Edgerton Hall. And that's probably the most interesting work uh, that I, I did in those 10 years. It, it was out of the usual, but it was, it was a real learning situation. Very interesting, working with construction people and architects. And, and I think in both cases, wonderful committees. A, a, a real diversity of, of knowledge and interests. I had the impression that you ended up on the committee, though, because maybe you were one of the people who said, gee, this isn't working, we should do something about it, and that you brought it to Paul's attention and pushed a little? <laughs> well, I certainly was pushing once I was on the committee. I don't think that I initiated being on the committee. But or even at, saying that the student center really ought to be looked at again and maybe reworked? I probably murmured that to somebody, and, and then they picked me up on it. And I think it was Steve Immerman who, who invited me to be on it. It was a real lesson. There were three architects, as I remember, who came in and gave their... Uh, their ideas about how to redo it. And it, it was a very interesting project. It was, it really was like taking a class for a year. It was great fun. Did you and he ever disagree over MIT issues? Oh yes, and over some Wheaton issues. Um, we've disagreed through the years and um, Every once in a while, somebody will say to me, I, I just don't understand where we fell apart. We never disagreed. <laughs> and I, I guess the two of us kind of thought that it was good to get it out in the open, air it out, and not go to bed mad. Despite the enormous time that both you and Paul have devoted to MIT, 
you seem to have carved out at least a little time for yourselves and your family. How did you manage that? Well, when you looked over, we started out by going through the calendar and picking out nights where we would really like to do something. And we wrote in what that something was. Well, then you would come to one of, you being figurative, uh, would come to one of the secretaries and you would say, I, I want to see Priscilla and Paul, and I want them to attend thus and so on Thursday night. And then you would lean right over her shoulder and look at the calendar, and it said, uh, Gray's out. Uh, and so immediately you were, you were on it. What were they going to do? Could it be canceled? Could it be changed? And it, it, it just became terribly difficult. Uh, so she, I, get, I think it uh, was Paul's administrative assistant who decided that she would put N slash S with a star. Star was a bonus, not scheduled. And so when you looked over her shoulder, she'd say to you, oh, that's NS and it's starred. Can't do anything with that. And we did perhaps two of those a month. And we tried very hard to keep Sundays because that was the one day that we could see our children and do things with the family. An article in Technology Review not too long ago said that Paul reads aloud to you every night. He does. It's true? It's true. What do you read? Oh, <laughs> you name it. Right now we're reading Mr. Roberts. Uh, the book is quite different from the movie. Very well written. And it's I'm glad we've seen the movie because it's interesting to see what they changed and distorted and so forth. So does do you pick these books together or does he choose them and surprise you or do you we, well, take Well, we're always on the lookout. I pick some and he picks some. This one turned out to be uh, one that our son sent us uh, in October. He had just read it and, and said it was such a good read. And wouldn't we enjoy it? And it's a mix. Uh, over the years, it's a mix of fiction, nonfiction, biography. Have you had any favorites? Yes, we've loved the David McCullough, the the history historian. Uh, every once in a while, we have a wonderful novel. We read about um, a woman who tried to row across the Atlantic and I think would have made it, except she ran into a hurricane. But um, that really was a, 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 a fleshing out of a diary into a book, but fascinating. We've read classics, we've read mysteries. Uh, and it's every night or a couple of nights a week? Our daughter gave us last Christmas um, the obituaries from The Economist. And if you read The Economist, uh, some of those obituaries are, are just lovely, even if you don't know the people. And uh, so if we run out of a book, it's all done, and we don't have another one to go, uh, we'll read those for a couple of nights. And this is pretty much every night? Oh, yes, yes. When the MIT Alumni Association made you an honorary member in 1977, were you surprised? Yes, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Did it make you feel any differently about MIT or your role at the Institute? Well, you know, that's, that's such an honor. And it was nice to think that that I'd made a difference and was worthy of it. 
nice solid feeling. Which was reinforced, I guess, when you were given the Lobdell Award subsequently for yes. significant service to the Alumni Association and MIT. Um, and then still later, the, the Bronze Beaver, um, the highest award. I don't know if you were the first wife of a president to be honored that way, do you? The Bronze Beaver? I don't know. How did you feel then? I mean, this was your <laughs> third time up at bat. <laughs> oh, it, it, that one was really exciting. We had, Virginia had just had twins. They had come early. Uh, she had developed uh, pulmonary embolism and was very sick. I was in Connecticut and Paul knew what was going on and said, you've got to come back just for that one day. And I was exhausted <laughs> and I thought, I've been to every single <laughs> alumni offices conference. Maybe I should skip this one. And he's, no, 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 <laughs> you come home. So, uh, and then when I walked in, it was at Walker Memorial, and it, uh, it was just overwhelming. <laughs> Let's back up and talk about your early years some more. Where were you born, and where did you grow up? I was born in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, my father was a banker, had survived the Depression. Um, and his father dropped dead on my first birthday. And my grandmother wanted him to go home and run this family dairy. And I don't think he, looking back on it, we didn't think, we were too young, one, I, and even growing up, I, I didn't really understand it all the ins and outs. I don't think he wanted to do that, but he was such a, a good sport, a kind man, that he did. And uh, So he gave up a career in banking yes. to be and a dairyman. We, ama we were amazed when he died, he really had understood the stock market and he had done very well to keep mom at home with caregivers. So he, he and you used were, that knowledge. You were one of three daughters? Yes, I was the, the oldest. oldest. What were you like as a child? Sick. <laughs> Uh, just just had some very nasty health problems. That probably would have been a one event kind of thing had we had antibiotics, but we didn't. And sulfur came along and they thought, hmm, here we go. And I was wildly allergic to it, about died from the sulfur. So it, it long about 12 or 13, I suddenly was me again, and uh, been fine ever since. Did you read a lot or sew a lot or? Read what? constantly. My uh, maternal grandmother was a beautiful embroiderer, and um, I had to be in certain positions sometimes because of the years. And she just, she taught me what she knew. She was left-handed, which was a blessing. She taught me to crochet and to knit and to sew. It made it easier because you were left-handed too. Yes. And she could show yes. you. Yes. I can take my girls knitting and fix their mistake and hand it back to them. But I can't knit on it because I go in the opposite direction from them. <laughs> and she knew that. And so when she taught me to knit, it was a natural. Were you involved in public service while you were growing up? Well, I was, I was part of a, a Girl Scout, a senior scout, Mariner group. And that woman turned out to be the, the leader of that troop, Louise Strongman, 
turned out to be a real mentor in my life and a role model. And um, she taught us all how to sail. And she took us all over the place. She took us on uh, two-week cruises on a brigantine, uh, you know, a four-master. It, it, we just had wonderful times. And in the process, we did a lot of community service. And we did street fairs in the summer, uh, which paid for our cruising. She believed everybody should go. And so we all worked all through the winter to get material, uh, learned how to silk screen to make skirt material and curtain material and so forth, and people bought it by the yard. Uh, we, we learned how to play games in a safe, big way, uh, had food stands, and we made a lot of money on those street sales. And that paid for the cruises. Where and were the cruises to? Um, the very first one, before the skipper knew that we really knew, knew what we were about, um, was Nantucket and the Vineyard. And back again, Woods Hole, and back again. And then from then on, it was a two-week cruise, and we went all the way up into Canada. Uh, we did the reversible falls in St. John's, had to take down the tops of the masts. And uh, that was an exciting night because you had to wait until the tides reversed. And he had to hit it just right. Was and there was the a Bay thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. And I was on watch and they had to lower the mainmast. And I got rolled up in it. Uh, it. It came down and they just lashed it down and tied it with with stops. And it wasn't until the storm was over. My big worry, I was safe, except if, if it petered out and they needed that sail to get them across. My big worry was that they'd unfurl it and I I was well above the deck. And then people, but they didn't until later on. And I, I was standing watch. And when the fury was over, there were only four on the watch. And, and, and of course, their big fear was that I was overboard. And so as soon as I could, I began to yell. But I had the noise had to subside, and somebody finally heard me. But uh, <laughs> you kept sailing anyway. Oh yes. <laughs> did you sail as an adult at MIT? Did Did you? Well, involve? I sailed for Wheaton, and I came up. Then they had intercollegiate uh, races, and I came up and sailed in those each year. And Paul and I sailed. It's the only. It's the only thing that I really regret. None of our kids have enjoyed it. Only two of the grandchildren have enjoyed it through MIT day camp. And uh, it's just one of those things. As you were growing up, did you think about having a career? Was that something that ran through your head? Or did you expect to marry and have children and raise your children? Uh, well. I don't know it's it, I don't know how to put that because I had started out as a biology major and biology was changing very quickly in those years um, and I could see that rapid change and I knew I wanted children and I thought even if I take 3 or 4 years out it, it could flip flop to the point where I, I I'm, I'm not there anymore. And so I switched to English and early childhood education, which was a good fit. And so I guess I just, I taught that, that year, almost two years. 
and I loved it. And when you look back, the next thing I did was Girl Scouts, which was the same kind of thing. Brownies first, then Girl Scouts, then Cubs. And then I went on and did the embroidery here at MIT. Went off and got my you certification. Went you went to college at a time when it was far less common for women to attend college. Was was it always obvious to you that you would go? Did your family, were your parents oh, yes, college was, educated? Yes, they were. And there was no question. Uh, a, a nice story about my family. My mother was one of ten. And three of them had died of smallpox. And... Um, those that were left, the first one went to Radcliffe, and when she got out, she helped the second one to go, and they did it right down the line for everyone, and then when the last one was done, all of them chipped together and sent my grandmother to BU for a degree in English, and she commuted from New Bedford, uh, for four years to do that. A, a, a lovely story. So education was very important. And uh, Did your mother go to Radcliffe too then? or She went to Simmons. Simmons. She went to Simmons. She really wanted to be a certified public accountant. She did all of my father's books. She settled estates. She was a certified public accountant, but they wouldn't they wouldn't make a woman a certified public accountant. And by the time they would, her three daughters said, come on, let's do that. And there was an exam, and she was in her 70s, and she just didn't have the courage to try it. But you were focused on issues like that as you were growing up. That's right. That's right. How did you choose where to go to college? What what drew you to Wheaton? Uh, it, it was going to be Wheaton or Radcliffe. And my mom and dad had great uh, concerns about Radcliffe because they pulled me through. I think they felt as if they'd pulled me through uh, 12, 13 years of bad health. And uh, there were those that thought it was silly to send me off at all. And so in the end, Wheaton turned out to be the perfect compromise. I loved it. it I wasn't sent off to the wilds of Cambridge. Uh, but it was a wonderful place for me. When did you get married, and how old were you? <laughs> I guess I was 22. We got married on June 18th, in 1955. Right after graduation? Right the after week your graduation? after I graduated. Yes. And I guess Paul had just gotten his master's. Yes. And we had that summer, and we lived in the Princeton University Housing Project, and then went into the service Labor Because Day. Paul was working at Princeton that summer or studying at Princeton? Well, he had a job with RCA and that was the cheapest temporary housing we could find. And RCA knew that he was going in the service and just was going to hold the job for him. So. What was that summer like? <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> um, the housing project were Quonset huts uh, all lined up. And we pulled in on a Sunday afternoon and we finally found our little section and we marked it foolishly by riding boots on the porch, the back porch of the first unit. Well, of course, the next day, taking the riding boots in, <laughs> so we had to go through the whole thing all over again. Um, it, it was, we were in a row of philosophers, 
and I, <laughs> our key to that that group of people was that Paul was an engineer, and everybody in, in those days wanted to buy an old bathtub and fit it into a metal shower so that their kids could have real baths. And here was this fellow that seemed to know how to do everything. <laughs> and so it wasn't mechanical engineering. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But, um, you know, he kind of knew how things went together. And uh, so that was... And then there was a little boy who lived across the street who kept saying to me, where are your children? You don't have any children. <laughs> and so he'd come over with an apple for me and an apple for him. And uh, he was my child for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> what were the Army years like? Again, we we were so lucky. We it, it was the Army Security Agency, and they took in a group from Texas A and M, Michigan, and MIT. I believe that was the mix, and uh, they made up a class. We'd all just graduated. We all happened to be married, no children. I was teaching, one other was teaching. Um, several had jobs in outlying communities. But it was just a natural peer group. And we did all kinds of things together. Came in town at Christmas time for the Messiah. Uh, we took them to the Cape. Uh, we, we did a lot of things. The Texas people had never been this far north, so. It, it, and you were basically at home. We, we were, we were basically at home. Did you live on a, a base or you lived in civilian type housing? No, the, it, uh, it, there was a long line for the base. And we had gone and found an apartment, and it was in the town of Lancaster, and the base was in air, and uh, so we were about 15, 20 minutes from the base. But that turned out for us to be a good thing. Uh, and following that, Paul and you came back to MIT, First as a grad student, what yes. were those years? You said he loved that period, and, and for you, what, what was that period like? Well, I had Virginia and um, settled into a duplex house in Belmont, had a lovely neighbor, had, had neighbors, got acquainted with the neighborhood, and uh, I was at a place where I could walk to everything. and. Uh, we thrived there. It was, it was. And good. you became pretty absorbed in having two young children. Yes, yes. Doc and Esther Edgerton were two or three blocks away, and uh, every and once Paul in a while, was working closely with Doc at that point. That's right. And every once in a while, they'd invite us for dinner, and uh, they came. And, and when Amy was born, they came and brought a tape recorder for Virginia to speak into. They had asked Paul, I think, beforehand if she'd ever heard her own voice. And he said no, and she was just delighted. You know, she, she thought that was a wonderful idea. Were you surprised when Paul got asked to stay on as a faculty member, and, or did it just sort of seg I very was naturally? I was delighted, because I, by that time, we realized that that's what he really wanted to do. So I was, tall, Paul never counts his chickens till they're hatched. And so it, once he had been asked to stay on, we were delighted and relieved. 
and life as a young faculty couple didn't did it feel much different from life as a graduate student couple or as a well I th an army think couple? it was a little more even he had experiments going by sunlights that was the only part of graduate school that was a little bit tough he he could easily be gone 18 hours or so because he had an experiment running so once he, he had the faculty appointment we saw more of him he was gone all day but but we saw more of him in the evening as Paul started being promoted into administrative jobs, did you and he think about how far he might go and whether the administrative track was something he and you wanted to do? I don't think in those early days we did. Uh, again, it, it's almost too simple to say we just went along. But he loved what he was doing. Ken Wadley was very persuasive. and uh, As long as he could teach and do these jobs, it was all right. And several of them were part-time, half-time jobs. Yes. Let's talk about some of those different posts and what they meant for him and for you and for your family. Was his life or yours very different when he became Associate Dean for Student Affairs, or was the rhythm still pretty much like when he was a full-time professor? I think the rhythm, there were occasional problems that kept him in here at night. Do you remember any of the issues he faced in the Dean's office? Um, did he ever bounce any of those problems from the office off of you? Once in a while, uh, there was a there was a very tragic situation that um, dis dis was very disturbing that he hadn't encountered before. He hadn't realized how rough it, it could be. Um, he also was doing freshman seminars in those years. And um, ha had some really sad experiences with freshmen. You know, either he had mental problems that nobody had disclosed. Uh, one young man was very homesick, and Paul brought him home. And he was going to stay overnight and go back with Paul the next day. And I said to him, he just had relaxed and had a lovely evening. We were all set to all go to bed. And I said to him, would you like to call home? Because he really had been dreadfully unhappy and I thought it might do well. To... And his father, who was a local physician, walked through the door as he called his mother and dropped dead on, in the hall. And <laughs> it, it, it just, it was it was a good lesson for our children. Uh, you just never know what's around the corner. And he left us and and did not return, and that was a sorrow. As painful as that was, Paul didn't run the other way and say, "Back to the classroom. Who needs this?" No, no. It was still about students. He had a two-year break between the time he left the dean's office and the time he became associate provost. Was that a more peaceful period in any way, or did he miss the administrative work? Well, you know, by that time we had four children, and my involvement with schools and scouts and all, I can't rem remember that as being. But it, it, the the one thing I can tell you is that after that period, when he became involved as associate provost, um, we did have to rethink uh, how we were going to be sure that we sat down all together with the children as a family. And sometimes that meant everybody getting up at six 
and having breakfast together. But we really, we really tried to do that every single day. But sometimes it was at one end of the day, and sometimes it was very early. How did the kids react to that? I think they were young enough, so as long as he was there, they didn't mind getting up a little bit earlier. But that implies that he wasn't always home evenings anymore. No, he which was. Which then fell to you to carry the day and the evening mm -hmm. and four kids. Mm. How rough was that? <laughs> we chuckled. The only time it was really awful was when he went to India for six weeks. And they had strep throats and they had ear aches and we had ice storms and it, he was gone all through January into February. I must have been nuts to say that that was a great idea. You didn't have a mother or an aunt who moved in and helped you in that period? Well, my mother was taking care of a grandmother and they would come up and uh, they came quite regularly during that time each week. But they couldn't just come and stay because they had responsibilities. The associate provost job, I think, was still a part-time mm -hmm. job. But then his next promotion was to dean of engineering, which is a huge job. Did you and he think that would change your lives much? Were you at the point where you said, knew enough about the administrative post to say this is going to be different. We thought it was going to be different, uh, but he looked forward to it. He, he he was very excited about it. He didn't have that job very long. No. No. Because he next got made chancellor. That's right. Which That's is, right. I mean, dean of engineering is a very big position at MIT and yes. Chancellor, you're up at the top. Were you all were you both surprised by these promotions um, or had you gotten used to his being plucked and uh, you know you kind crowned? of you kind of rolled with it. Uh, it uh, I guess the one thing, the one consistent thing for me was to be sure that we carved out enough time so he wasn't an absent father. During the demonstrations um, in the late 60s and, and early 70s, he and Constantine Simonides literally lived in here. I would bring clothes in and take clothes out, but it would be that kind of time. And he was on the news at night, and so the older kids saw him, but it was Wheezy's first year in kindergarten, and she was just worn out. So I'd pop her into bed, just not really realizing. And one Friday night, we could sleep late the next morning, and I said to Wheezy, I think you would like to stay up tonight and see Daddy. And he, she said, Daddy? And so the five of us were lined up, and he came on, and she said, she looked at Andrew, and she said, Andrew, he's not dead. And I tell you, that really threw the two of us for a loop. That little girl had thought she was dead and had not said anything, so nobody could. And I never should have been putting her to bed, you know. I should have kept her up. Anyhow, those uh, things. Did, did that prompt you to do anything differently? Was there anything differently that you could do at that point? Yes, we. He came home on on Sundays, faithfully, um, and that made a huge difference because nobody was in school, and the kids were remarkable about not planning anything on Sundays. It wasn't until Virginia got into high school and was working on her high school yearbook, and she simply brought the whole crowd 
home to us rather than be gone on a Sunday. So they were quite remarkable at, at keeping Sunday for the family. When, when he was chancellor, the two of you used to run dinners out at your house. I think you were in Winchester in a big Victorian house. Yes. What was the idea behind those dinners? And I think you had a lot of people and a lot of dinners. Yes. We could seat 36, and so that was the maximum. And we did them back to back. We did them Friday night and Saturday night because you get all those dishes out and you do all that cooking. It really is just as easy to do it for two nights and then have it done for a month than to, to put it in into two weekends. And the kids helped us uh, serving beforehand and, and they really were fun. And the children took part in something where they met people that, that they wouldn't have met any other way. And uh, it, it was a good thing to do. Paul just wanted groups of people to sit down, I think, Karen, and know each other in a different way than around uh, the department activities and so forth. This was the entire administrative council, I think, that you were running through. Yes, this, which was we did a hundred uh, people or so, plus maybe spouses and friends. Yes, we always did spouses. Uh, we felt they shouldn't be left out. We did a farewell party for Emily Wick, and uh, <laughs> that turned into a fiasco because I did the meal. But MIT cooked the meat because I didn't have enough un ovens. And we had decided as a real treat we'd do a rack of lamb. <laughs> they did a beautiful job on the lamb, but they forgot to cut the bone. So Ken Wadley and Paul were downstairs with a saw cutting lamb chops apart one at a time. And I'll tell you to this day, there are people in that department that that say, do you still serve lamb? <laughs> How did your children feel about MIT? Do you think they felt any part of it themselves? And as they've grown up, have they said, gee, there was a real trade-off between his working and the time he had to spent, and, and that might have been more of our time? I'd never heard them say that. Um, they thought there were real benefits. Um, they came in here for swimming le lessons on Friday afternoons. And then we went and gathered Paul, and we went over to Regina's in the North End and had pizza. And then we went bowling in the old bowling alley in the student center. And so those were those were very precious nights. And then the faculty club, when they used to be open all the time, used to have by the pound night. And the kids would hop on this great big um, medical scale and we paid what they weighed. <laughs> and they thought that was incredible. <laughs> the two older ones ate enough to <laughs> cover what the younger ones did. But, you know, I, I they couldn't have helped but feel part of this. And at one point, Paul was being considered for another position. And it had gotten to the point where they wanted to take us to this other campus. And we were talking about it at breakfast time. And uh, Andrew it was Andrew, who said, how many bathrooms are there where we're going to live? And Paul said, I have no idea. And he said, well, we have one on each floor and one under the stairs and one in the cellar. Unless they have four, I don't think you should go. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, the next night, 
it, that same night, this was in the morning, that same night, one of them said, I don't know whether you called yet to say what you're going to do, but if we're going to live this way, we'd rather live this way for MIT than for some other place. Interesting. And so Paul called and said we would not be pursuing that. <laughs> so MIT can thank your children for uh, <laughs> saving him. Well, it, would, it, it tells you probably how that they did feel a part of this. When he was being considered for the presidency here, did he and you give any serious consideration to the possibility of not taking on such an enormous job? No, I guess we sort of thought that if it happened, that was the way it was meant to be. We did, we did think a lot about the move, because Into how it had moved out out of the house of the president's house. Yeah, Lair and, and Jerry had never lived moved there. Into it, right. And uh, we felt strongly that that there needed to be a family in that house. But you know whether it should be our family was. <laughs> Another question. Were any of the children living at home when you moved into the house as president? There would have been, no, no. Andrew was a freshman at Middlebury. And the year before, we, uh, Weezy and Andrew were very dyslexic. And we had found uh, Weezy, uh, a wonderful school, which uh, had a dyslexic program. And so that decision had been made long before there were any questions about uh, moving in here. So they really, they didn't feel removed from the nest, so to speak. Paul had been chancellor for many years, and both of you had worked closely with the Wiesners. Were there any surprises when he became president? Um, including for you? Well, you know, Jerry was wonderful, we, and, and we had such a close relationship with Jerry all through those years. Um, you know, Paul was on sabbatical in Wales, and I'm not sure whether it was a sabbatical year or two years later when we went back in the summer, but Jerry and Leah came all that way and came to see us, and we had a lovely time together. Um, the, the, when the children went to MIT day camp, they didn't go after day camp. They didn't go back to Paul's office. They went back to Jerry's office. And for a long time, I didn't know that was happening. And then when I did, I didn't get very clear answers. And Jerry told me later that he had orange juice and fruit and fudgicles and all kinds of nice things in his refrigerator. And so he was just waiting for them. And of course, Paul was right across the hall. <clears throat> what? And Jerry sat down with Paul and me, and he was the one that said, sell the Winchester house. You don't need to be absentee landlord and landlady. And you'll be halfway around the world when a toilet breaks out there and it's going to be Priscilla's headache to fix it up. And he said, don't do it. And the other thing he said was that on any given night, you're going to have four or five invitations. And all kinds of things were going to dictate when you said yes ones you should do for the institute, ones you should do for a trustee or a corporation member. One, there would be a very varying number of things you really had to do. But every once in a while, he said, back off, and there's something you really want to do, do it. You will always leave three or four feeling annoyed with you and once in a while do something you really want to do. That was very good advice. 
Yeah. Did Leah give you any particular advice as you came in? Uh, oh, Leah was such a lovely lady. She, uh, no, but she, she held my hand that first year, you know. We, we talked on the phone often. I got into a conflict with a group on campus and the fire department about how many people uh, the house could hold. And I, I really felt between the rock and the hard place. And it was Leah who helped me work it through and she was wonderful on the phone. What kinds of trade-offs were there in taking on the presidency in, in time? in terms of loss of privacy, and the time obviously was considerable, much well, more even than the chancellor's job, which oh, yes. was pretty hefty. I, you live over the store, and most of it's wonderful, and every once in a while it's really hot. But um, we, were one, we were very lucky. We had a wonderful group of people that lived with us. I called them the the PH gang, but they they were very, excuse me, very special. For President's House. Yes. What was it like to suddenly inherit a, a staff for your house? I mean, did that seem well, odd or it, it, feel it, uncomfortable it seemed, in any way? It, it seemed a little bizarre at first, um, but again, it was who it was. Uh, one or two were not a good match, but we ended up. We had we had eight years where it just worked together so smoothly. And at some point, you probably were used to working with these people. Not only had you chosen who you were working with, but. Uh, you fell we really into a rhythm were a of knowing each in other. A sense. Uh, and you've stayed close to some of these people like family. I yes, think. yes, yes, we have. How would you describe your responsibilities as First Lady of MIT, and what did you call yourself? Did you think of yourself as the First Lady, or <laughs> did you have a different name? You, you sort of z z hit a, a sore point. I would, I would periodically have to respond and fill out the blanks, and uh, <laughs> the one that really um, caught me was, did I work, or was I just a housewife, or, and I, after the last or, I put partner to whatever he was at the time. Was it a full-time job for you, or, or even more oh. than full-time? Oh, yes. I worked easily 16-hour, 17-hour days, some days. Over the years, there's been discussion in the higher education community about whether spouses of presidents should be given formal titles and paid for their services, and I think some campuses have moved to doing that. Did you receive any kind of pay ever? No. What do you think of the idea? I'm not sure that, you know, I, I was part of the bargain. <laughs> I came <laughs> with Paul. But I think, and, and I know there's a great deal of um, unease about paying a first lady for the job she does. And I think probably it shouldn't be as pay, but perhaps a, a monetary gift at the end that's in her name for her to use as, as she wants. Uh -huh. You know, nothing commensurate with how many years they're in the job. Right. But, but. Uh, I guess it's a type of issue that, that gained more attention with the White House, having Hillary Clinton, who mm -hmm. had a full-time career. Um, it's a tough one. It really is. Mm -hmm. 
but I think there are too many side issues for a straight salary. Yet I don't think there's a single first lady that I've known that's put her heart and soul into it that would have would not have appreciated a, a, a gift at the end. There were certainly honors after you moved out. At some point, the the house was named for you and Paul. It's now the Gray House. That's right. Paul and Priscilla, <laughs> Priscilla and Paul Gray House. What was your reaction to that? Blew us away. <laughs> <laughs> How much entertaining did you do in the house when you lived there? Oh, a lot. I, I was astounded when they totaled up the numbers because we had kept all of our calendars. I, I just couldn't believe how many people we fed. How many? Do you remember? Oh, yes. It was in the thousands. It, it was just, just a lot of people. Who came to the house? Was there anyone in particular that you recall or particular events that stick in your mind? There were dignitaries. There were um, families and mourners after MIT professors' funerals. We had started that with uh, Doc Edgerton. We, we carried on because you got everybody here and then where were they going to go to gather? And they needed to gather, so we did that. There were faculty, uh, there were department things, there were housemasters, there were students, there were senior dinners, there was a kindergarten group that <laughs> visited me summer and fall, uh, spring and fall. Let's see, who else? Just, just senior anybody. Dinners. I, I think you had a hand in creating them? Yes. What was... Uh, well, it was Joe Martori. Do you remember Joe Martori in the uh, alumni no, office? No, He and I sat on the back, uh, sat in the back seat of a careening bus in Mexico with an alumni group. And I wanted somehow to make sure that every MIT student had been in the president's house once. It's very easy for student leaders to be in the president's house. Uh, and the freshmen do or don't come with the freshman reception, but a lot don't. And so I was looking for a way, and February seemed the natural month. IAP was over. And Joe thought the Alumni Association would be glad to, to be a part of this because they wanted a way to put forth the Alumni Association um, information. Before their the story. class, the senior class. That's right. And so uh, we got together and we did it for the month of February. Uh, the, first, the first February, I had a favorite lasagna recipe. We ate lasagna for the month of February. Paul, so that everybody would have the same dish. And after the last one, Paul said, well, I don't want lasagna again for at least a year. Can we mix it up? Well, in the next year, I said, to dining, what do you want to do? Well, they did chicken ten different ways. We clucked at the end of the time. <laughs> So, I, by the third year, we, we had it down. We had lasagna and chicken and, you know, we had a variety. But we had a wonderful time. Uh, each student got up and said where they came from, what their major was, and what they thought they were going to do next. And uh, there were some pranksters. <laughs> Uh, one night we had cockroaches um, in plastic tubes that looked, uh, blocks that looked like ice cubes. And there were about four of them in the dining room. And one of the waiters, just as we'd called the kids in, had spotted one 
and he just did a quick cruise around the room. Got all four. They're over at the museum now. Uh, we and downstairs in the president's house, there are lovely antique faucets. I don't know if they're still there, but that was a very stealable thing. So physical plant bought us regular, normal, whatever you bought in 1980, faucets and handles. And, and we put those in the 1st of January, and we took them out the 1st of, Fe uh, put them in the 1st of February, took them out the 1st of March, and that put an end to losing the valuable antiques. But it, it was a real education. I think we probably kept up with them pretty well. <laughs> were there any weddings in the house when you were there? Yes. A graduate student who had been a roommate of our oldest daughter at Wesleyan, Charlotte Gibbs, who lived with us for all those years at the house, was married our last year there, um, and two of our children were married in the chapel and the reception was at the house. How about the gardens? Did you get involved with them? Oh, yes. I, I love gardens. And uh, when we hired Bill Flannery, we, we went to work on the gardens. And uh, they, they really were just lovely. Uh, he's no longer at MIT. And I haven't seen the gardens in bloom, but uh, that they really were a thing of beauty. And you got down on your hands and knees, I think, yes? Oh, yes. I <laughs> Did you have favorite flowers that you put back there, dahlias or? Yes, I, and I, he made me a wonderful rose garden along the wall there by the driveway, and I picked roses all summer. So did other people, but <laughs> it didn't matter because they picked them because they were just too beautiful to leave there. Did Paul have to do much traveling as president, and, and did you accompany him on many trips? Yes, he did a lot of traveling. And I usually went with him, uh, not always because I was going to be part of, of the meetings he was going for, but I could do the alumni things, and it was just nice to have somebody in the hotel that you knew at the end of the day. Do any trips stick in your mind as particularly fun or difficult or interesting? The two trips to Egypt were just, I just thought were absolutely incredible. And that was a time when um, I was invited to all of it. it and I, I loved that. Uh, visits to Japan, and then it turned out that our son lived and worked there for seven years, so it, it was a nice introduction to what his life was going to be. Did you get to meet the emperor and the empress of Japan at one point, too? Yes, we did. That was an interesting story. Paul was being given an award, and he couldn't go at the time that it was being given, and so he went over and uh, met with the emperor and empress and was given the award then. And I called Masa Ayakawa and said, I know I have to take a gift. I have no idea what to take. And she had been with us that summer when we made green tomato relish. And she said, bring a couple of bottles of relish. They love pickles. So I did. The only thing was that um, I was a great saver and recycler, and that they were in old mayonnaise jars. They weren't in proper jars. She said, don't worry about that. Well, lo and behold, we had a lovely interview. We were taken back into a room that, if you had not guessed, you would have thought came out of a Victorian 
castle, you know, full of furniture and just just looked more English than Japanese. Loved the pickles. Could could I send any more? <laughs> <laughs> and so an MIT professor had the the, the job to carry the pickles, and he was delighted because he got a chance to go go into the palace. Did you send the recipe too? Well, I did, but it, 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 you can't get the green tomatoes in the same. I, I think so, and the tumor. You then we shared a grandchild. Um, I, her, the empress and emperor, had a granddaughter one morning, and our first grandchild from that family, Marie, was born that night. And so I sent her a recipe for Play-Doh when the child was about a year old. And they could not get, um, it was one ingredient they couldn't get. And I yeah. bought them several cans and <laughs> sent it and got a sweet note back. So. You, you met some other dignitaries as you traveled on MIT business too, I think. Any who, any of those? that are particularly memorable? Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> she was a very interesting lady. We, we went to uh, 10 Downing Street for dinner on a night that was in the 90s in London, unheard of. Windows all locked tight, no fans. It was, it was stifling. And she decided that we ought to have ice water which was a great idea. She got the glasses out and she elected me to help her dole out the water. This is so Margaret forth. Thatcher. This is Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and it ended up that I put the ice in and she poured, but she was very unhappy with me because I put three or four ice cubes in and she kept saying, no, and I didn't understand what she was saying no about. Finally, she said, we only have enough ice for one cube of glass. <laughs> and of course, it was gone before the people ever saw it. But she was kind of a, uh, you know, one on one. She was a very interesting lady. Paul did a lot of fundraising. Did and. You mentioned that you did go along on, on many of those visits. Did, did you have a particular role or a pattern or what, what kind of? Uh... Well, I, was, I, I came in if we took them out to dinner or out, out to lunch, if there was a social aspect to the ask. And I think I just softened it a little bit. <laughs> When Paul stepped down as president and became chairman of the MIT Corporation, what was that period like? Did he work any less or travel any less, or, or did he keep going at pretty much the same speed? Well, there's, there's kind of two parts to that. You remember that we had a glitch there, um, and so we stayed on an extra, I think it was five months. That's when Paul, uh, when Phil Sharp said he would become president and that's changed right. his mind. That's yeah. right. And I had planned a summer where we would be away from here. Um, I really thought it was a good idea for us to get out of town and let the new people settle in and so forth and so on. And after I made all the plans and reservations and so forth, um, it turned topsy-turvy. Uh, and so that when the change actually came on October 15th, it was a much, much harder change for Paul. You know, he, right up to midnight on the 15th, he was worrying and working on things. In the morning of the 16th, it was Chuck Best's problem. And you didn't. And have Chuck that was period. very kind and included him, but that was a that was a truly hard period of time for Paul, and it was it was hard that five 
month extension was hard. We didn't, we had to cancel some of the plans. We had twin granddaughters that arrived early. I think I mentioned that earlier. So I was gone for a good part of the time, and Wheezy stepped in and, and took my place. But it, it, it was hard. We were neither one thing nor the other. Right. Aside from that intermediate period, did you miss the days of the presidency at all, or was it mostly a relief not? To, to be on call all the time. We missed the people, but but they. We tried not to be pests, and they came to see us. Quite often. Uh, I jokingly said I missed the flowers, <laughs> and the freezers, and and I did. You know, we still get sent a big smoked turkey at Christmas. I have no place to put one now. <laughs> Um, and the flowers were lovely uh, for the first year. Paul, Paul kind of signed up for a flower of the month arrangement, and uh, that that eased me through that. But it, it that last five or six months had been so hectic that it was it was good to slow down through the presidency. And I guess longer. You you had a summer home or a weekend house in Rhode Island. We when we sold the Winchester house, we put that money into building a home in Rhode Island, and it's year year round. And we had always thought that we would retire there, but my buddy is is really flunking retirement, <laughs> so we're trying hard to live there. As as much of a week as we can, we we go down for long weekends. Have you been any better at retirement than he has? Well, yes, in a way, I have. <laughs> um, I've eliminated things that uh, I just I I don't work as fast as I used to. Mm -hmm. I don't have the stamina I used to. I used to have tremendous energy. I think it's called aging. <laughs> <laughs> Although you've become the honorary chair of the Women's League again, I understand, yes. uh, because Tom Byrne is now the spouse of the president. Yes. And so you've stepped up to do that. Yes. Talk about some of the activities that, that you were involved in, the, the Women's League, the Public Service Center. I'm still involved in, in the public service center. You helped get that off the ground. Yes. I um, maybe dreamed it up. I, I don't no, know where the Shirley idea. No, Shirley McBay dreamed it up and asked if I would just kind of keep my mind on it and shepherd it along. And so I've been co-chair of the steering committee uh, 23 years, excuse me, this, this November. So that was a good fit. It was. It was. And what uh, did you do with the PSC? Well, what was your role besides being the co-chair? I mean, what were there particular activities that you were involved in? We started with the money we had in our pocket. Shirley McBay had it in her department, but the next year she was going to have it as a line item in her budget, and she left. And so the next dean of students wasn't sure there was any interest for him, um, but stuck with us and was, was very kind, but there still was no money. So it was just plain hard work at the beginning. And you did some fundraising for it, I think, and there's mm -hmm. a, a Priscilla King Gray Public Service Fund. Um, that I think is described as a mainstay of the center's work. How did that come about? Well, uh, we we needed endowment. We needed something that would last over time. And so if I was successful in raising money, I asked if it could go into the endowment. And we've, we've done pretty well. I think we could do better, but 
We're chugging along. And the PSC does what kind of work? Is it student activities it's in the community or what? Well, it's it's both now. We started out in the Cambridge Public Schools math in the schools in Boston. Um, we did a lot of the, the Casper, the facility here in Cambridge. We did a lot of things locally. Um, but um, we was we were saying just recently that we still do a tremendous amount locally, but the overseas things have taken the spotlight. They seem so much more glamorous. In terms of student volunteering or student? Yes, in publicity mm -hmm. from the outside looking in. Those are the projects. Yeah. How about the Women's League and, and its predecessor organizations? What, How important were they and what did you try to do with them? There was the element of, of service there, has always been. And they've, they've done things for the, for the core of MIT that probably no other group could really have done. Um, they've, they've, for instance, we raised and, and shepherded the reorganization of that hall that is the Elizabeth Killian Hall. Um, the music? The music hall, yes. In, in Building 14? Yes. Um, al alumni supported that. But that was a league um, idea and pursued it. And we're doing things in the community. We're supporting a homeless shelter and now supporting children, buying bunk beds and that kind of thing for homeless. But center. in your early years, it was a way of, of getting some of the MIT wives engaged with the Institute and with each that's other. Right. And in and the doing early years, service. that's really how I got to know the Institute. Uh, Other than through Paul and the fraternity and, and yeah, uh, with Jean Doc Brown Edgerton. And, mm -hmm. And that's how I got involved in freshman, with Paul's freshman seminars, and how we, as a as a league, tried to encourage young wives, tried to make it easier for young wives to ask students into their home. And this initially was wives of faculty who were doing this, and then you set up a, a wives of graduate student organization. Yes. They've, they've been very good with the graduate student organizations. They also do the English classes and now do the English classes for the... Um, Employee. Yes. Employees. I was going to say physical plant, but it isn't physical plant anymore. Facilities. 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 Right. But it started as English classes for the... For graduate student spouses because many of them were coming from other countries and weren't comfortable with English. That's right. And I meet occasionally when I'm in Japan with those wives and they continue to meet, practice their English, and they look back on the time here as a, as a real joy. Uh, because they got drawn in through those classes. That's right. But there was enough of their culture in the other members, you know, there was that bond with other members, but they got pulled in. And they might. Did you teach English? Uh, no, no, I never did, but I taught embroidery. How did that start? Well, the embroidery, a woman named Renee Fell had taught here at the Institute, and her husband was about to retire from. Uh, Harvard, he was a very famous linguistics teacher, and they were going out to California. And she said, you go off to school and get your certification, and you take over after I leave. So her last year at MIT, I went to uh, 
went off and did my certification and came back and I taught from uh, 78 to 07. It's a long run. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of the, well, and you, you volunteered at the hospital all those years, too. That came about. Uh, Dr. Mel Avery graduated from Wheaton about six years before I did, but I had gotten to know her in a mentoring alumni program, and she was chief uh, pediatrician at Children's, and she established the newborn, the neonatal clinic. And she said to me one day at a meeting at Wheaton, do you have any time for you yourself? And I said, no, not a lot. And she said, I have something I think you'd like to do. And she set it up and they trained me. And that was in 82 and I've been doing it ever since. And you're still doing it. Yes. And that going. special something was? Rocking babies. <laughs> Wonderful. It's, it's So you've carved out Wednesdays and you still yes. save your Wednesdays yes. to, to go cuddle those babies that need yes. cuddling. That's right. What are the biggest changes you've seen at MIT since you first came to know it? Well, the women such a wholesome part in such a large part of this community. That's a great thing. Do you think that having more women students and faculty and staff has changed it significantly other than having them there? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that the culture doesn't embrace the woman and the woman adapts to the culture. Uh, we watched our, we've had a grandchild who graduated a year ago, well, last June, and we watched her, and she certainly, um, she certainly learned quickly, but she certainly was a full-blown MIT student within the first six months. She was at Sloan or undergrad? Undergrad. She was an undergrad. You and Paul have been involved in an effort to put together a retirement community for MIT and Harvard people in Kendall Square near MIT. Can you tell us about that? It's an interesting project. We got approached by uh, two people at Harvard. Um, we put our heart and souls into it for a long time. Um, I don't I don't know how to put it tactfully because I don't feel very tactful about it. <laughs> but it it really fell into the hands of of um, well realtors who took over from the developers. But initially, you you liked the idea of uh, oh, we liked you know, the idea very much, and we worked. We wanted it to be a whole community. Mm -hmm. We worked with the thought that there would be computers and business machines so mm -hmm. that people who still wanted to be active could could work in, the, in that room and not have to have all that equipment in there. But apartment. it was an alternate. It was an alternate. To, to your place down in Rhode Island. That's right. In other right. words, a different vision of retirement. That's right. And it was... It was to be, um, we were going to have a, a little health facility there. It was going to be people with, with common interests sh who right. really hadn't cut the, cut the, the cord, cord with MIT. Like you and Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and we would have used it just as we use 100 Memorial Drive. We would have uh, come and gone and been right. in Rhode, I Rhode Island as much as we so could. So it may yet evolve or it may not, whatever That's is right. going to happen it, it at this point. unhappily ended in the courts and it's been a, it's not been a happy uh, ending yet. Yeah, but it's not over yet. No. Paul said it seemed to be moving finally. Yes. <laughs> Paul 
got inv involved with Wheaton. Had you been involved? How did he get pulled in? And had you been an active alumna? Or? I, I'd been an active alumna, and they were looking. They had no representation on the board of anyone in higher education, and they really felt that need. And they were looking for someone. And um, one day the president just happened to run into me and said, what's Paul doing now? <laughs> and uh, I, I told him, and I think that night he called to see if Paul would like to be on the board. And Paul is very careful about those things and made sure that that was all right with the people here. Mm -hmm. Then it, uh, Larry Backow has been on the Wheaton board, and he's just stepped down, and Kurt Colenbrander is on the board. So there's been an MIT right. presence. Interesting. An article about you and Paul said that in his spare time, Paul enjoyed making furniture. Have, do you have many pieces? Do, is, oh, yes. Has he had enough time to? Well, he's just finished a beautiful dining room table for me that was to be for the new apartment. Oh. And um, wherever we are in the next six months, I hope the table is with us. It's all wrapped up in the cellar in Rhode Island, and it's time to begin to use it. When Paul stepped down as chairman, there was a big dinner to honor you and Paul. And at the time, you mentioned that you had heard Liz Killian talk about the people who were at MIT as the canvas of her sale. And you said you had thought initially it was a strange thing to say, but had come to embrace her choice of words. Do you have any favorite words to, to describe the experience that, that you've had for the past 60 years? Is any metaphors, or, or is that the one that works in the end? Well, that certainly does work. Uh, it, it really has been a privilege to be part of this community. I call um, MIT a huge family, and there are layers and layers, but everyone is part of it, and it's, it's been a real privilege to get to know know them. Well, and a privilege for MIT to ha have you as well as Paul. Thank you. And a privilege for us to talk to you this morning. Thank you very much. Our time has run out, but uh, it's been very interesting and fun. Thank you so much. Thank you.